Hi everybody, I'm, uh, welcome to the, uh, this online webcast, thank you so much for everybody for joining. Um, today I'd like to introduce myself, I'm Ruth Darville and I'm here today with Guy Collins and I'm going to be talking about um, um, online research methods, my own, my own research and other people's, some thoughts about and examples of online health research using the internet. To start with, I'll just give you a brief uh, explanation of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, starting with my own research of carrying out in, uh, in, uh, research on using the internet, and um, then I'll give a few examples of other people's work who have uh, using the internet at the moment for different to show the diversity of the different kinds of work that's going on at the moment. I'm going to talk through some of the potential benefits and challenges of using the internet and uh, talk about some of the ethical issues that came up as well during my own research and that other people have come up with. And in particular, I uh, will be raising the issue of anonymity on the internet. There are lots of different ways of carrying out, uh, loads of different ways of carrying out research on the internet uh, that people have, have used. For example, the natural observation is one method where you just lift out the data that's already there on the internet uh, from from web chat or from a forum that are, uh, people already uh, add their information to, which you can just lift out and analyse. Then there's an online servers, exactly the same as postal servers, but using the internet as, as a mediating factor. And interviews, which can be carried out uh, um, in real time or synchronous or asynchronous, or discussion groups. I want to give a few examples of some of the research that's going on at the moment. For example, um, Maged Kamal Poulos is, wor is working on um, a second life, which is a virtual world where you can set up a, a site. And Plymouth have in there they've got a, a sexual health site, uh, and Kamal and Maged is at the moment evaluating people who have visited the site, what they've thought of it, and and how they found it to be. Uh, then there's Sito Marimba, who's carrying out work on the internet, looking at factors that influence uh, e-learning, feelings of connectedness on the internet. Among the factors that he's looking at are synchronous and asynchronous methods, learning styles, IT competency and native language of participants. And there's uh, another project, very interesting project, that's going on with my own colleague Siobhan Sharkey and Ray Jones and uh, a team in Exeter that's looking at collaborative learning on the web. And they are setting up internet sites where they're going to uh, have self-harmers and uh, well, they'll have three different groups, one with self-harmers and one with a group of health professionals and self-harmers and uh, another with a different ratio of uh, health professionals to self-harmers and looking at the differences. And then, then it brings me to my own research, which was an online bulletin board f um, study, focus group study. So to tell you a little bit about my own research, I, I carried out a bulletin board study for my PhD, uh, where my sample of women group uh, was a group of first-time pregnant women. Uh, and I ran a focus group study over a four-week period where I uh, placed a post on the site and topic, conversation topics, discussion points, and women responded uh, over, uh, left the, the, I left the uh, points up for several days and waited for their response and then put up uh, the next discussion point or topic. So, uh, moving on from there, I wanted to talk to you about some of the potential advantages of online data collection. Uh, for example, the cost and time saving of carrying out uh, work on the internet is quite considerable. In my own experience, uh, being able to lift the data out of the uh, uh, of the internet without any transcription is a, a major time saving. Um, and and similarly, with online surveys, you you don't have to the data entry and you don't have any postage costs. So there can be some considerable time savings for that. Um, then there's the convenience for the participants. That um, in my again in my own study, women did say how uh, convenient it was for them to be able to access the study at any time. And the internet is 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 very has been shown to be good for engaging difficult to reach groups. For example, um, socially marginalised groups, the people, disabled, 
you know, people who can't get to uh, to a specific site to take part in research. Um, are also good at reaching hidden or inaccessible groups, such as work that's been carried out with recreational drug users or men abused by their female sexual partners or sellers of illegal drugs, all of whom may not come forward in face-to-face -face situations but have taken part in research online. Um, and a previous piece of research that is, was in my own field was a, a study that was carried out on pregnant women uh, who were on complete bed rest and of course they wouldn't have been able to take part in the research had it not been for the fact that it was mediated with the on, uh, online. And I wanted to move on and talk about some of the potential advantages uh, that are talked about when you're talk, talking about internet, uh, use of the internet for gathering data. Uh, firstly, the, the wide geographical access and the ability to reach large numbers of participants. Obviously, the internet stretches far and wide, and uh, so it does give the potential of reaching very large numbers of people. Um, the discussion of sensitive issues online is, 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 a possible, is a potential advantage in that people may be more likely to disclose online where they may be less likely to face to face. Um, and this, this, in, this increase in self-disclosure, it may be due to some of it, possibly due to the anonymity, but it certainly allows, it might allow people to overcome some of their shyness. Some potential challenges of internet data collection. Um, access to the internet obviously is, is, uh, is an issue, although month on month it's, it's becoming less of an issue as the use of the internet is increasing year on year with the estimated increase at the moment at about 25% of every three months. Um, an issue again would be, might be the ability of participants and the researcher to understand the technology. I came to this very much as a naive uh, researcher in technology uh, and certainly there were things that I had to learn along the way. For example, some of the, some of the um, language that's used it, it was, was something I'd never come across. When you set up a bulletin board site, you have to set uh, ground rules, for example, and uh, it, within those ground rules are things such as uh, not allowing flaming, which was a word I'd never come across. Um, and what it actually means is it, it's using hostile language on the internet. But those kind of things you're not necessarily going to know about. It's, it, it, it's a training need that people need to be aware of. So in my own study, um, the first thing I did was I went to CETO Maramba, to help, who helped very kindly help me set up the um, bulletin board study, and we developed a private bullet, bulletin board template to suit the study, and CETO helped me to make the site look how I wanted it to look, um, and train me in how to use the system. Um, recruitment to the study, despite the fact that uh, the potential, some of the potential benefits I've mentioned are the wide geographical access to the internet, I didn't find that to be the case. I, what I did was I went to uh, about seven already existing um, fora for pregnant women and asked the moderators if I could place an advert onto their site, and which they make a small charge for. Um, but I got few responses that way, and in fact I found by by sending it to my own distribution lists and asking people to send it to their distribution lists was the way that I had most people came into my study. Now, I wanted to, this, I brought up this discussion point. I'm hoping that people will respond to this by, um, by now going into the chat room and putting their thoughts on this. And that is, are there any differences in the ethical considerations between traditional methods and online methods? I'll give you a few minutes to, to have a think about that and just and and actually post into the, uh, uh, the onto the site so we can have a look and I'll come back in a minute.
while you're talking about that, I'll carry on with my with my uh, my own points around the ethical issues and see if it adds to your thoughts at all. Um, uh, getting informed consent for my study. In, uh, in my study, what I did was I, uh, I once people had contacted me, I sent them a link that took them to a, a page, a registration page, which had the patient information on it and at the bottom of that I had two tags. One was a tag that said I consent to take part and one was a tag that said I don't consent. So if people consented then it took them through to where they could register and begin to post. But there are issues around uh, around uh, informed consent online. It, it may not be quite so clear cut to gain consent online and it may be that some ethical committees ethics committees may still insist on a signature so it, it, it's, it's something that um, it, it's not necessarily possible to tell who is uh, consenting to take part and whether they are who they say they are. Confidentiality is another issue that comes up um, because it's not always possible to offer confidentiality as it can be in face to face. Uh, filing cabinets can be locked, desks can be locked and rooms can be locked but uh, it isn't possible necessarily to destroy information that's, that's written on the internet uh, and it may be that law enforcement agencies can subpoena research data as well. W who is taking part is an issue if you, if particularly if you need to uh, people to be over 18 if you're dealing with sensitive issues because there is actually no way of knowing whether people are over 18 or not even if they claim to be. There, then there are data protection issues, um, the information online can be tampered with, data stored on the internet is open to problems caused by viruses, bugs and hackers and easy to guess passwords uh, and if sensitive issues are being discussed that could be an issue, people could eavesdrop for example, uh, which is where the offering of confidentiality becomes a little bit blurred. Similarly, what is private and what is public, there's a, there's a very definite blurring of public and private places on the internet. And whilst people believe their communication to be private, in fact the responses on the internet are traceable and research conducted online does leave a permanent trace. So it is an issue uh, and it, we need to be careful how we re re reassure participants that their responses will be kept confidential. There are ways of... Uh, there are ways of um, encrypting data, but that requires more technology and more expertise. The next issue I want to talk about, which really has come up in a lot of what I've talked about, is the anony is anonymity in my own study. What I found, I asked women in the, to select a pseudonym and to remain anonymous from each other so that they could feel comfortable talking to each other. And at the end of my study, I asked women to talk about how it felt to, to, to use a pseudonym. And many of them said that it allowed them to be more honest and open in their discussions. And one woman even said it not only did it allow her to be more honest with other people in this group, but to be more honest with herself, which shows that there can be a definite benefit from confidentiality. But there is this issue about how you couch uh, the anonymity uh, along with the confidentiality and it, it, it needs to be carefully considered. Um, it may be that people, uh, it could be that people listening in here now might have an opinion on this because it, it, there's a very fine line between what you can offer in terms of confidentiality online or anonymity and there are various issues that have come up for me. Now this is this is a slide which shows uh, a, a, a cartoon from the New Yorker and what it says is on the internet nobody knows you're a dog and it very clearly shows that uh, a good point about in, it, using the internet for research it's not always possible to know who is on the other side and whether they're being honest. And this actual the quote on the internet no, no, nobody knows you're a dog comes from a very useful reference which I'm putting up here for you now and if anybody's interested it's a, it's a very good reference uh, looking at anonym, anonymity in internet social interactions and I'm sure that this is being saved so you can come back to this slide keep it up there for a moment so that you can take, take the reference down My next point is actually a discussion point. How similar are online responses to, to traditional face-to-face -face responses in research? 
if I give you a few more minutes, perhaps you can add some of your own evidence or um, empirical studies that you know about onto the web chat and we can have a little discussion about that. So there looks like there's a lot of interesting chat going on in the chat room actually and some things that maybe we can pick up on later and talk about in more detail. Um, I thought I'd just carry on now because time is running out. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the, how non the differences, as you're talking about yourselves, the differences between the non-face-to-face -face interactions. 
visual cues are very important in social interaction, which is something that uh, social psychology has shown that to be the case. So um, I wanted to maybe flag up, I don't want to talk too much about theory, but there were, just to flag up the couple of theories that are around that are trying to explain anonymity um, on the internet. For example, there's the equalisation hypothesis that suggests that computer environments should lead to a more equal playing field. Um, it, the the equalisation theory suggests that people from a lower social, st uh, traditional social group, such as uh, women or people in minority groups, might find that they have more power in an online environment where they have some anonymity. Although this isn't always um, proved, confirmed by, by the research. Um, then there's the classic the de-individuation de uh, theory, which comes from classic de-individuation theories around crowd behaviour that came from um, some explanations of uh, football hooliganism, which suggested that people in, in crowds tended to behave uh, in, uh, against the reduces their individual restraint uh, and people lose their sense of awareness. That was the original classic theory of deindividuation, although it has kind of it has been shown that there was very there wasn't a great deal of uh, support for this theory. More recently, there's been the side theory, the social identity of deindividuation effects, and that theory proposes that anonymity in computer mediated communication can be positive or negative, depending on the kind of anonymity that's being offered, and it shows. Um, in, gr in group situations, it's, it suggests that groups become more polarised by online communication uh, through more group identifi identification, perhaps because they overestimate their similarities with others. So that the side theory suggests that it's a transition from, from uh, the personal identity to the social identity that creates the uh, effect on, of anonymity online. I wanted to end my part of, uh, before I pass over to Guy, who's going to talk to you about his experience of online research, just to give you an indication of some of the pros and cons that I found myself. I, I found the, the, the using the online method produced very rich data, and I also found that all the respondents in my study participated fully in that I had 16 women taking part. And for every topic that I put online, I got a response from, from all of them, which was great. Um, I used an asynchronous method, which everyone found to be convenient. Um, the, the immediate access to the data was, of course, a real bonus. And I have found it to be a really useful and exciting way to carry out research, but it's also given, us, given me a lot to think about in terms of uh, ethics. In terms of cons, the recruitment wasn't easy in my case, and I did find in the end that uh, I did have a fairly limited sample, uh, and that's something an issue which often happens in research, but something which wasn't solved through internet use. So thank you very much. I will now pass you over to Guy, who will we'll just spend a minute or two changing our slides around, um, and I'll leave you to chat in the room. That. Um, good afternoon everybody, it's uh, nice to see that we've got lots of people actually within the uh, webcast uh, joining us this afternoon so thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about um, two forms of um, online uh, data collection tools that I've utilised uh, within my own research. Uh, say Ruth has already talked about the strengths and limitations at, at length of using different tools so I'm going to focus in on uh, my specific tools that I've utilised. I'm going to just give you a bit of a, a brief background to uh, why I'm actually utilising these tools within my research. 
and then I'm going to talk about uh, examples which are one are the use of an online questionnaire that I've utilized and the second example the use of an asynchronous uh, discussion software Okay, um, I've utilised these tools as part of my PhD. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm looking at public perceptions uh, around volunteer community first responders in the NHS ambulance service. And I'm utilising um, these methods as part of two of the phases of the research for data collection. Uh, my study's actually got four phases in total. Um, and that these two phases that I'm utilising consist of a web-based questionnaire, as I said, an asynchronous uh, discussion board. In addition to the data collection tools, I'm utilising additional data analysis software, specifically um, Questback, SPSS and Frameworks. I'm not going to be talking about those this afternoon, however, due to the, the limitations of, of time. So, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, use of an online questionnaire. Um, ordinarily, um, sampling for um, online questionnaires have defined populations, whether that be demographic, looking at specifically um, age, gender, location, etc., um, or specific activities or, or interests that the uh, target population are involved or interested in. For my own study, um, I wanted to compare um, an online version of a street survey um, to gain a, a perception related to the general population. In addition to the web questionnaire um, that I've utilised, I've also conducted a face-to-face -face, uh, questionnaire utilising the same questions. So it's, it was twofold um, utilising these questions. In order to actually recruit to the online questionnaire, I uh, utilised a, a variety of, of approaches, uh, inclusive of snowball email techniques, similar to uh, what Ruth has already outlined for her own research, where I contacted my uh, contacts list and asked people to then actually forward that um, request on. Um, I also um, set up a social network group on Facebook, which I'm going to show you a slide for in, in a moment, and I also put links on different forums. Uh, or fora as well, inclusive of uh, Gumtree, Taluna, um, one on Tiskali. Um, I didn't actually outline on those forums what the research was actually about. Um, I just asked participants to actually have a look at the um, the questionnaire. And the reason I didn't outline what the research was about for several reasons. One reason being that um, I felt that if I told people um, what the research was actually going to be about they may feel that, well, I don't know a lot about that subject already, therefore I can't answer the questionnaire. Um, so I, I didn't divulge um, the actual subject area until they actually um, commenced and um, consented to participating in the actual questionnaire itself. In addition to those um, approaches, I also used a Google ad campaign, and again I'm going to show you a slide for that in, in a moment. Um, and I also um, other other approach that I utilised for recruitment was that with the face-to-face uh, -face questionnaire that I conducted on the street, quite often, um, because it was in a, a busy shopping centre, people would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm too busy at, at the moment to help. Um, so what I actually did is I passed them a, a flyer which had the actual web link of the questionnaire as well, so they could actually, if they were interested, could go home and then log on and um, complete the questionnaire at their own convenience. What I'm going to ask you to um, just have a think about now in the, in the chat room together um, are what do uh, people actually think about the validity of using uh, self-selecting samples as I've outlined here um, and secondly have you got any suggestions about how the sampling could have been carried out differently here specifically so we're going to uh, give you uh, just five minutes just to 
have a discussion with in the chat room there. Thanks. He said it was on. Just answering, um, I think it's Helen there asking how many people actually uh, filled out via the uh, flyer. Um, that was collated as part of the demographics on the questionnaire, so people were asked um, how did they actually find out about the questionnaire, whether it was Facebook, Google Ads, or um, or the, uh, the four different t posting on forums, and um, obviously on the other would cover the, the flyers. Okay, some interesting points that people have made there within the chat room. Um, we will just move on a bit further, be conscious of, of time. Um, on this um, slide now, um, this is a, a partial um, screenshot of the um, Google Ad campaign that I utilised as um, one of my tools for recruitment for the uh, web questionnaire. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, in the top left hand corner you'll see the advert that I posted um, which just stated um, interesting five minute survey help complete my questionnaire for my PhD thanks for your time and then with a relevant web link underneath so I didn't actually divulge to people what the uh, questionnaire was about um, on the advert itself for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with utilizing Google Ads um, it works by you actually identifying yourself a list of different keywords. Um, so I selected a, a variety of keywords, um, some of them related to topical news events, um, uh, include things such as um, credit crunch was one of the keywords, uh, Olympics, Paralympics, etc. etc. 
Um, and how that actually works is that when people actually put those keywords or link those keywords within a Google search, then potentially your advert may actually appear on the right hand side of, of Google um, search results and also in related sites areas or related links for, for Google as well. Um, I also limited the budget because obviously I hadn't got an endless budget for this advertising unfortunately so I limited it to £30 a month um, therefore um, I couldn't actually spend over that amount um, of, of my budget and actually on the um, page there for, for Google Ads um, it lists the actual number of impressions that you actually get so the amount of times it actually appears um, when people type in the related keyword and also on Google Ads it gives you a click conversion rate as well so the amount of times people actually click on, onto your link as well um, just because actually click onto the Google ad and get booted to the website however doesn't actually mean they actually then go on to complete the questionnaire however within my questionnaire itself it did have as I said earlier um, as part of the um, final demographics page it does ask, or ask the participants to detail how they actually found out about the uh, questionnaire Okay. The next um, screenshot here, and again, hopefully you can see this okay. This is um, from the Facebook social networking group that I set up, and this was called um, "Help Me Get a PhD." Um, and I just set it up, um, putting um, some basic details again, saying to people basically they spend too much time on on uh, Facebook. Um, maybe they could spend five minutes constructively um, clicking on my link and going to my questionnaire and again I didn't divulge specifically what the questionnaire was, was about at this stage um, the actual um, people actually joined the group were predominantly um, younger people I should say um, who may possibly but not always um, be more used to actually utilising Facebook rather than um, different age groups but this I felt actually um, enriched my research because it helped me actually access um, hard to reach groups such as um, young people which may have been difficult to access um, by any different means. The next slide gives you a, a screenshot there of the uh, web questionnaire that I utilised and this was um, conducted within Questback. So, uh, within Questback you construct your questionnaire um, and as people actually complete the questionnaire um, the um, data results are actually collated um, automatically by Questback um, which is only very uh, basic collation that actually performs if you want to perform any de more detailed analysis then you have to utilise um, other tools and for myself I'm actually utilising SPSS um, that screenshot there actually shows you um, part of the data collection, uh, one of the questionnaire and the actual responses in a in a bar chart there, that participants um, answered. Okay, so just moving on on further now, I'm going to talk about the uh, use of an asynchronous um, discussion uh, software that I, I've actually utilised as well. For my own research, I'm um, aiming to actually engage previous service users in the research. Um, I'm still in the process at the moment of getting um, IRS um, ethics approval for this phase and I've got um, ongoing discussions with um, an NHS ambulance organisation with reference to actually um, identifying their previous service users. So I'm going to identify um, service users within the last um, two years if you have accessed the Community First Responder Scheme. The uh, forum will actually um, utilise bulletin board software which uh, has been adapted and it will actually be asynchronous. Um, just touching on something that uh, Ruth has, has um, mentioned and we've actually discussed within the actual chat room as well, uh, within my own uh, bulletin board um, participants have the option uh, with their username um, of actually choosing whether they actually want to 
um, utilise a pseudonym um, if they want to maintain their anonymity. Uh, with my own bulletin board, it's not open to the, the uh, general public, however, people uh, will actually be invited via letter. Um, and as I said, I've got their personal details, or will have their details um, sent via the ambulance service to participants. And then people actually have a, a simple code to actually put in onto the website which will allow them access. And then they actually register um, and consent to participating in the research and choose their own username for and password for future um, additions to the discussion board. Within my own um, discussion board, the forum will consist of a series of topics related to the research question, and the participants will have the option of making their comments against each topic area of discussion. They haven't got to make a comment against each topic if they don't don't want to. So it's obviously all, all optional. The participants will be able to view other people's comments because ultimately it's not um, um, an interview. Um, it is aim to be um, a discussion forum where people can actually um, interact and respond and discuss ideas am amongst themselves. However, within within my own um, forum, I've actually disabled the um, ability to email one another. So people um, should feel secure and protected in the fact that they can't actually uh, be pestered um, by emails from other participants. I think that's something that somebody raised in the chat room earlier on. Um, so it will be um, a closed uh, forum and discussion postings only appear or communications only appear within the forum itself. Also to um, um, ensure the, the safety of the participants, um, the forum will be moderated as well to ensure that nothing is inappropriate and there's no flaming uh, occurring as Ruth mentioned. Um, and also if there is actually a need to censor any of the information if there is any potential breaches of confidentiality. Hopefully that won't occur however because um, the participants are provided with clear guidelines um, as part of a, a code of conduct of what they should be doing within the forum so hopefully there won't be any, any breaches of confidentiality and, and I won't have to intervene in any way. That screenshot there just shows you the, the home page of the, of the forum. I don't know if you can pick everything out there but it's just a general welcome to the forum and that's on that home page is where they put their unique um, code in to access um, the registration and login pages and on the home page as well they've got uh, tabs there for frequently asked questions, um, the list for the forum code of conduct and also a contact, li contact link where they can email myself directly. The next screenshot there is of uh, partially of the, the topics and hopefully you can see there it's got the topics listed um, and it will actually show you on that screen the number of posts against each topic and who actually conducted the last post. Um, there's not many posts on there at the moment because we're just trialling this at the moment and eyeing in out any um, teething problems um, before it actually um, goes live following ethical approval. And the next page there shows you the, the screenshot when um, participants actually click on the topic they're booted to that screen where they can actually um, add a comment title so it's actually distinguished that it is their comment and it relates to that topic and then they can actually type in their message and if they want to they can actually put any smiley faces on there if they want to as well. Okay, um, just going to stop there just for a bit of a breather um, and get you to, to think um, about um, some issues about um, accessibility um, in relation to online data collection. Um, I've utilised um, the discussion board um, previously um, with a group of students just to pilot and see how discussion boards actually worked. Um, and I did find that there were issues about accessibility, not just about in relation to access to internet, whether they've actually internet in the first place or 
use of public access internet sites, but issues of accessibility in terms of um, issues such as um, vision, um, language, um, if, it, if English for instance isn't their first language and the discussion board is only conducted in English, um, but also uh, potential um, disabilities as well. I had one student who had dyslexia who told me after the um, board was actually run that he felt that he wasn't able to actually interact on the discuss discussion board due to his dyslexia um, due to potentially actually making any um, um, grammatical errors actually on the discussion board so I'm just going to quieten up for a few minutes um, and get you to have a think and post a few comments on the, uh, the chat room about um, accessibility Okay, just going to move on again because time is flying by. Um, Sorry, okay. What I'm going to um, uh, round off my section of the presentation is actually considering the use of uh, synchronous in comparison to um, asynchronous um, discussion boards, particularly. Um, in relation to synchronous, obviously there are specific dates and time as you're involved in the um, webcast today. Um, so it ensures that everybody does or do 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 know the actual dates of, of data collection. However, there are limitations there that some some people may not actually be available on a specific date or, or time. 
Uh, one benefit of synchronous is, however, it does enable immediate interaction um, between everybody. And that can also enable greater uh, fluid discussion uh, because it can bat, bat back and forth amongst all of the participants. Uh, whereas asynchronous, there may be a, a time delay of not only um, hours but potentially several days or even weeks, and that could hinder uh, discussion. The benefit of synchronous as well is that the research can address any queries as a collective to all the participants um, straight away and uh, immediately as well. One of the potential limitations or, or challenges, should I say, of uh, synchronous uh, data collection, as in, say, um, a webcast as, as this or, or um, for another board, is the potential for uh, domination or reclu reclusion. Um, going back to some of the theory that Ruth mentioned earlier on is that um, some people may have greater uh, confidence levels and therefore may appear to actually um, dominate um, the actual um, dialogue whereas other people um, feel that they, they can't actually participate because other people are, are dominating the, dis the discussions. However, with an, an asynchronous um, data collection, um, it does allow um, a wider window of, of opportunity, so the uh, data collection can occur over days and, and weeks, as I think Ruth said hers was over six weeks earlier on, is that right? Four weeks. Four weeks, sorry, four weeks. And asynchronous also allows for more time for re reflection and a structuring of, of, of a response, I think something that uh, Ruth Endicott uh, picked up on as well within the uh, chat room there as well, that people can actually sit back and actually think um, what they're actually typing in and, 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 and stating, rather than perhaps with synchronous feeling they've got to type something quickly to, to participate. Um, potential limitation though of asynchronous is that it can be uh, a potential for a survey style response rather than a discussion. Um, that can be linked to the actual way uh, topics and questions are actually um, worded, um, but it also can be uh, as a result is that people aren't actually all online at the same time discussing with one another. And obviously the researcher can't be online 24-7 to provide immediate support with um, an asynchronous forum. Okay, so discussion points, we've already discussed one to three, so um, I think it's quite timely just to um, finish up on, on question number, or discussion point number four there, and that has anybody else within the uh, chat room today, have they used um, online data collection um, in similar approaches to either myself or Ruth, um, or have they used any um, different approaches that they'd like to share with um, both us and other people within the chat room. So we're going to go over to the uh, chat room just for about three minutes I think that we've only got and then we'll, we'll wind it up so we finish bang on four o'clock for everybody. Thanks very much.
Okay, folks, it's just um, four o'clock uh, UK time now. Um, so we hope that you found um, our webcast um, interesting and useful. Um, we're conscious that we weren't able really to um, discuss uh, back to you, really, because we're too busy getting used to the technology on, on the <laughs> webcast and looking at our um, our own presentations. But if you'd like to have um, any further discussions with either myself or, or, or Ruth or, to, or together, we've got our um, email addresses um, there for you. Um, so thanks very much for, for logging in and uh, speak to you again sometime. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.